right, welcome everyone. Thank you again for joining us this week. Uh, my name is Matt Bobel. I'm one of the colorectal surgery fellows at Trinity Health Ann Arbor. And um, we have Dr. Joseph Trulisi with us this week. He is a colorectal surgeon at Laser Surgery Care in New York City and assistant clinical professor of surgery at the Icon School of Medicine at Mount Sinai. He completed colon and rectal surgery training at Thomas Jefferson University Hospital in Philadelphia and general surgery training at Rutgers University after earning his medical degree from Jefferson Medical College. Dr. Tulisi is an investigator in the Anchor Study and his clinical practice and research focus on anal HPV disease. And he's gonna be talking to us tonight about anal cancer screening and prevention. Take it away, Dr. Tulisi. Thanks, Matt. Yeah, so today I'll talk about um, anal dysplasia, anal cancer screening, a topic that colorectal surgeons don't get involved in too much, but um, I think colorectal surgeons are um, a great group of people to, um, to do the screening because they have a lot of the skills that some of the other specialties who do it actually may be lacking. So um, just some disclosures. These are some companies that um, fund some of the studies that we're doing in our practice right now. Um, the objectives of tonight would be to go over the epidemiology of anal HPV disease, uh, describe the rationale for anal cancer screening, uh, define the role of cytology and high-risk HPV testing in dysplasia screening protocols, um, describe how we evaluate and treat perianal and intraanal dysplasia, and to review the benefits of HPV vaccination. So um, most anal cancers are um, squamous cell carcinomas, and um, they're almost all due to chronic HPV infections. Um, 16 and 18 are the most oncogenic strains, but there are several strains that can lead to anal cancer. Um, and anal cancer is preceded by anal HCL, which is a precancerous lesion that if we find, we could um, get rid of the HCL to prevent the progression to cancer. Anal HCL is morphologically similar to um, cervical HCL, and perianal HCL is similar to vaginal and vulvar HCL. Um, similar to cervical um, cancer, anal cancers develop in the squamous metaplastic zone, the area where the uh, squamar columnar, squamal columnar junction occurs. So um, it's considered a rare cancer, but um, incidence is increasing among every age group. In 2022, there are approximately 10,000 new anal cancer cases and 1,600 deaths. It's more common in women than men, and certain groups are at an increased risk. Those groups include people living with HIV, patients taking immunosuppressive medications, men who have sex with men, women with a history of cervical gynecologic, um, sorry, gynecologic HPV disease, and individuals with, with a history of anal warts. Um, this chart shows um, the rates of anal cancer in high-risk groups compared to the rates of other cancers in the general population. So um, the first three graphs, the first three lines in this graph are anal cancer. The top one is HIV negative men who have sex with men. The second one is HIV positive men in general. And the third line is HIV positive men who have sex with men, in which the incidence is similar to HIV positive women. So this group um, has an incidence of 131 per 100,000. In some studies, it's up to 200 per 100,000. And you can see the rates of anal cancer in these groups are higher than um, all other cancers in general population. Um, colon cancer is a rate of about 39 to 40 per 100,000. Um, where you can see like HIV um, positive um, men with sex with men is you know, 131 per 100,000. So if you could screen, um, it would be worth screening. Uh, it's also important to note that cervical cancer now is about seven per 100,000, where before screening took place, it was closer to the rates of anal cancer and HIV negative men with sex with men, about 35 to 40 per 100,000. The risk factors for anal cancer um, is HIV, um, both pre and post um, retroviral treatment, um, there is an increased risk. Um, the rates are similar um, in, both, um, in both eras. Actually, since heart, um, rates are slowly increasing. And I just thought it's due to prolonged um, lifespan since treatment is better for HIV. Um, HIV um, risk factor cannot be explained by immunosuppression alone because when the immune system suppressed by medication that's still not as high as HIV. So I thought there's some synergistic effect between the two viruses. Um, inherited immune disorders, um, immunosuppressive medications are risk factors, um, anogenital HPV infections such as condyloma, smoking, MSM activity, increased number of lifetime sexual partners, chronic irritation from fistulous fissures and hemorrhoids, 
they're all risk factors for anal cancer. And in some studies, receptive anal intercourse is a risk factor, and in other studies, it's not. And it's important to note that um, HPV infection um, does occur in the anus in individuals who do not engage in anal intercourse. So um, some patients are embarrassed. They come to the doctor with you know, anal cancer, anal condyloma, and they think they're going to be judged on you know, what they do um, privately, but HPV can spread from the cervix to the vagina and to the anal area. So this um, sh chart shows the epidemiology of anal HPV infection um, in um, men of sex of men. Um, it's interesting to see that the incidence increases up to like around 35 and then stays stable throughout the lifetime. Um, in HIV negative men of sex of men, um, about 50 to 60% will test positive for HPV. Um, and that, like I said, goes around for every um, decade of life. And this is different than for cervical um, HPV infections, which generally peak around age 35 and then have a steady decline throughout the rest of life. Um, HIV positive men of sex with men will almost always test positive for high risk HPV. Um, more than 90% will test positive for any high risk for any HPV strain. Um, and 16, 52, and 53 are the most common strains in HIV positive men of sex with men. Um, HIV negative men, sorry, HIV positive men of sex with women um, also have very high risk of anal HPV infections. Again, so anal sex is not necessary for the acquisition of anal HPV. And 25% of HIV negative men of sex with, men will, with women will test positive for anal HPV, and about a third are with high risk HPV strains. Um, HIV negative women. Um, about 27% will test positive for anal HPV. So very similar to cervical HPV rates. Um, it's anal HPV in this group is three times um, higher in women who have had a history of cervical HPV infection. Like I said before, with the men of sex of men and women, there's also no decline in HPV infection with age as a seam of cervical HPV. It's not really known why we don't see this decrease. It's thought that um, maybe chronic irritation from bowel movements, um, give it better um, conditions for the HPV to, to stay and continue to replicate. There's a high concordance of cervical and anal HPV genotypes. So if a woman has HPV 16 in the cervix, a good chance she'll test positive in the anal canal. Um, HIV positive women, uh, and more of these women, and these women will find HPV more in the anal canal than in the cervix. So this group is very um, high risk for anal cancer. Um, in HIV positive women, um, a lower CD4 count and cervical HPV infection are associated with higher rates of anal HPV, and receptive anal intercourse is not, is not a risk factor for HPV infection in HIV positive women. The epidemiology of anal HCL is, you know, it's, the risk factors are very similar to, um, to anal cancer. Um, HIV positive men, with men and HIV positive women are the highest prevalence of anal HCL. 81% um, of these patients will have anal neoplasia, and about half of these patients will have anal HCL. Um, San Francisco studies showed similar rates in the pre and post heart eras, and um, the rates are very similar to in um, HIV positive men who have sex with women. So, you know, you think of this as a problem for women or men who have sex with men, but men who have sex with women who are HIV positive are also high risk for anal HCL. HIV negative men who have sex with men. Um, we'll find uh, about 35% will have um, anal dysplasia and about a quarter will have anal HCL. Um, other increased um, risk, fact, risk groups would be renal transplant recipients and women with a history of cervical vaginal or vulvar dysplasia. There have been no studies with HCL and HIV negative men of sex with women just for high risk HPV in that group. So men of sex with women with women who are not immunosuppressed are really not at a risk for anal cancer. So the screening we do is very similar to cervical cancer screening. Um, there are a lot of retrospective studies that were done before the ANCHOR trial that showed that um, anal cancer screening is valuable. Um, the first one I have listed here is a study by Weiss et al. of 124 HIV positive men and women. So all the patients were offered treatment of their HCL, but 22 per, uh, patients uh, decline treatment. Of those patients, 9.1 progressed to anal cancer at 9 and 28 months, 
whereas none of the patients who received treatment progressed to cancer. Uh, the next study by Devaraj et al. Um, involved HIV positive men and women. Um, this group did not treat um, any of the, of the HL they found, and 7.5% per, percent of their patients progressed to anal cancer with a mean of 32 months. It's interesting that the authors concluded that this low rate of progression to cancer um, concluded that you know, anal cancer screening may not be necessary. But in my eyes, 7.5%, um, that's a pretty high risk of uh, progression to cancer. The next study by Watson et al. involved um, men and women who are immunosuppressed, not only from HIV, but from other um, causes of immunosuppression. 55% of patients who had anal dysplasia um, that were not treated, that included both low-grade and high-grade dysplasia, 15% progressed to anal cancer with a mean of 42 months. Um, the Goldstone paper um, was one of the largest um, series that was published, and it was an early uh, series, involved um, 456 HIV-positive men with sex with men and 271 HIV-negative men with sex with men. And they were followed out to three, um, you know, with a mean, mean follow-up of three years. Some were followed out up to 10 years. Um, the rate of, of cancer progression is 1.1% in the HIV-positive group. Um, there are five patients who, who progressed to cancer. Of those five, only one was being actively treated um, with the H cell. Three patients were lost to follow-up, and one patient um, had such severe HIV disease, he stopped undergoing treatment. So out of those 456 patients that were initially included, only one progressed to cancer. Of the 271 um, HIV-negative patients, none progressed to cancer. So they reported 0.1% overall progression to cancer rate. Um, Michael Geiser recently published a paper of 330 HIV positive um, men and women, all had HCL and all were treated with the median follow up of about a year. There was no cancer progression in that group. Um, however, Anchor was the first randomized controlled trial that was just published June of last year um, looking at um, anal cancer screening. So there are 25 sites um, around the country. It was a randomized controlled trial. Um, to be enrolled, the patients had to be HIV positive, 35 years of age or older, and had biopsy proven anal H cell. They were randomly assigned to receive active monitoring or treatment of the H of the H cell. Um, most treatment involved um, office-based ablative procedures. However, topical um, treatments were allowed in the study. Only 5% of um, patients were treated with topical therapy. The primary outcome was progression to cancer, and um, all the patients underwent a high-resolution endoscopy every six months, or more frequently if the clinician thought it was necessary. In the treatment group, whenever someone developed a new H cell lesion or recurrent lesion, um, the lesion was biopsied. Um, in the active monitoring group, um, these patients re required um, a biopsy at least once a year, and also anytime there was a concern for cancer, any lesions were biopsied. Um, this graph, you may not be able to read it. It's very small. I just want to give you a list of the demographics. So the highlights of this, of this chart is that um, the median age was 51 years in both groups. Median follow-up was about um, two years, a little bit longer. 80% um, of the males in both, 80% of participants in both groups were male. Underrepresented minorities involved a large percentage of, the, of our uh, patient population. Um, about a third were current smokers. Um, almost all patients were um, but virally suppressed and had a good CD4 count. And um, only about 12.8% of participants had um, more than 50% circumferential disease, either intraanally or perianally. So the results, um, uh, about 4,000 patients were randomized and almost all the patients um, you know, completed the trial. The median follow-up was 25.8 years, nine cases of cancer, occurred in the treatment group where 21 cases of cancer occurred in the observation group. So the conclusion was that 50% of cancer was prevented through treatment. Um, if I could just like editorialize a little bit from the study, um, you know, 57% is a good number, but I think that in, in practice, we see much higher, um, more, more efficacious results than 57%. I think that probably about 95% of anal cancers can be prevented um, with good screening. Um, some reasons for this is that when the study was designed, the goal was to get um, over 5,000 patients enrolled and then follow for um, five years after the last patient enrolled to be able to detect a difference in the two groups. However, the data is being analyzed at an ongoing basis. And as soon as any difference was found between the groups, 
um, the study ended and everyone in the observation group was offered treatment um, you know, to prevent these patients from getting anal cancer. So I think if we followed up longer, we would find that there'd be a higher um, you know, efficacy rate of treatment. Um, another reason is that you know, we're doing a lot of biopsies in the observation group. So um, at least once a year, all the HCL lesions were being biopsied. Um, also, if we thought that a lesion looked like it may be turning to cancer, oftentimes we do several biopsies of the same lesion. So I think we're slowly um, you know, partially treating um, the, uh, the observed patients. Um, another problem is, you know, we're doing ongoing quality assurance analysis, and um, some of the some of the sites, um, it seems like some of the lesions were not being always um, detected. Um, there was not always um, proper, you know, full treatment of the HL that was being treated. So I think in you know in good hands, we could even see much higher than fifty seven percent um, efficacy rate. This is the Kaplan Meyer curve of the um, results from the anchor trial. The top graph shows you the rates of cancer progression in the active monitoring group, uh, and the, the red line shows the progression of cancer in the treatment group. So um, we see like in the first six months, um, very similar results. And as the study went on, um, the, the, the big difference um, in cancer rates among the two groups. Also, the treatments were um, pretty well tolerated. So, um, you know, every adverse effect that, uh, that happened during the study um, was, was documented. That includes anything from a car accident to pneumonia, appendicitis, everything was documented. But looking at the trial-related serious adverse event, events, there are only seven in the um, treatment group and one in the active monitoring group. Um, and these um, adverse events included some minor abscesses due to either biopsy or cautery, some pain, ulceration due to the topicals, um, but no, no real terrible adverse events in either group. So um, how do we actually go about screening? So we'll talk a lot about, um, you know, if, if you want to get started in screening, kind of a guide on what to do. First thing, we always start with the history and physical. Um, the, the questions we usually ask, um, you know, we see a patient for the first time involve um, questions related to their, like, anorectal health. So if they have any change in bowel habits, um, you know, look for incontinence, um, any, any symptoms they may be having, uh, so we could treat those as well. Just general health questions, make sure that they're H, if they're HIV positive, that they're being you know, optimized. If they're a renal transplant recipient, um, if they're immune, you know, they're, if they're immune, immunosuppressants are maybe at too high of a dose, um, just make sure that everything is optimized. Also ask questions related to HPV disease. So if they've had abnormal um, cervical paps, if they've had any vulvar vaginal dysplasia, if they've had anal warts, um, if they have a sexual partner, find out their HPV status, make sure they've been vaccinated for HPV because um, a lot of times we could you know, vaccinate these patients. Uh, also make sure they're doing their standard um, cancer screening. So make sure they're up to date with their colonoscopy, their cervical paps, mammograms even. Um, ask a lot of social history questions. Um, a lot of these patients, um, you know, do have anal sex. They may not be getting like STI screening appropriately. So, you know, in our office, we offer um, STI screening. Um, smoking cessation is important. See if they're doing any illicit drugs that could be harmful to their health. Physical examination, um, you know, just general examination, focusing on the abdomen, lymph nodes, you know, maybe cervical lymph nodes to look for, um, you know, any kind of small, you know, um, oropharyngeal cancers, inguinal lymph node examination. And um, we'll do a, an anorectal examination um, after we collect the cytology specimen. So then the, the specific tests that we do for um, anal cancer screening are basically stolen from the gynecologist when they do the cervical cancer screening. So we do anal cytology, similar to how they do the cervical pap test. Um, on the same swab, we could do anal HPV testing. Um, for any abnormalities, we'll go to high resolution anoscopy and biopsy any suspicious lesions. And the HRA is analogous to the colposcopy. And then we treat um, the HL spots um, similar to the treatment of cervical HL. So anal cytology is just um, a Q-tip that we use. It's a Dacron swab. And we sample the epithelial cells from the entire anal canal. Like I said, on that same swab, we could do HPV testing. And then the results are reported um, with the Bethesda system terminology. And that's either reported as normal, um, low-grade dysplasia or high-grade dysplasia. Um, sometimes we get a result called ASCUS, which is atypical cells of undetermined significance. 
So the cytologist looks at the cells and they may not look totally normal, but they can tell us, oh, there's definitely low grade or high grade dysplasia. They'll report that as ASCA, it's very typical cells. In the um, cervical swabs, we'll only see it about 2% of the time. We get ASCA's results about 30% of the time. It's probably just due to some minor inflammation from, from hemorrhoids or fissures or fistulas. But whenever we get an ASCUS result, we'll, we'll recommend doing high resolution anoscopy the same as we would if we got an HCL or LCL result. Um, this swab, this is a Dacron swab that we use. Uh, it takes about 20, 30 seconds of um, you know, rotating the swab in the anal canal. And then um, the cells are released into this thin prep solution that goes to the cytologist. After the, the PAP test, we'll do a digital anal rectal examination. Uh, it's important to explain to the patient, like, as you know, um, we're going to do the examination, so they're not, you know, shocked what we're going to do. They kind of know what to expect. It's important to look at the outside before we actually um, insert the finger, um, just to look for any evidence of um, external HPV disease. Uh, we apply lubricant. We use a numbing lubricant, and we palpate the anal verge going out to about five centimeters to um, see if we could notice any subcutaneous nodules. Then we insert the finger um, into the distal rectum and we palpate the entire distal rectum and anal canal. And we do um, sweeps from like proximal to distal um, all the way around to palpate the rectovaginal septum, the cervix or the prostate. Also palpate posteriorly for any retrorectal masses and then inspect your finger for any kind of blood. So if um, we find an abnormal cervical, uh, sorry, an abnormal anal cytology, if we find high risk HPV, we feel anything or see anything on examination, or if a patient's at like a high risk of anal cancer, then we'll go right to um, high resolution anoscopy. Um, if all these tests come back negative, we should recommend reevaluating in about 12 months because the, um, the anal pap test can miss the lesions and come back as benign um, because there are hemorrhoids that may get in the way. We may not actually have the swab rub against the entire um, surface. Um, but the thought is that with repeated examinations, we'll be able to detect an abnormality before cancer develops. So if someone has an abnormality, we'll do the high-resolution anoscopy, look for anal HCL. If we find it, we recommend treatment. And then after treatment, we'll repeat um, the cytology and HRA again in six months. If there's no HCL present, then we just reevaluate in a year. This kind of shows the equipment that we use. Um, this is just a, a swab with um, just gauze wrapped around it, and it's sitting in acetic acid, 5% acetic acid, which is basically just white vinegar. And that sits in the anal canal for about a minute until and then we'll get started with the with a high resolution anoscopy. This is the anoscope we use. It's clear plastic, and it has um, like a 90 degree, like a flat tip to it. So we could use this to really push into the, the rectal folds and the hemorrhoids to open up so we can see the whole um, circum, um, circumference of the, of the lining. Um, a numbing lubricant. This is Lugol's iodine. It's a concentrated iodine solution that we use to rub onto the mucosa to help us find the H cell lesions. Um, this is a Dacron swab that goes in the cytology solution. Some large um, scopettes to wipe away any debris and more swabs to brush on acetic acid and iodine. So we insert the um, clear plastic anoscope, withdraw the obturator, and this is the acetic acid so soaked gauze that sits in the anal canal for one to two minutes before withdrawing and then taking a look inside. Um, we use an, uh, um, a colposcope to perform HRA. Um, I really recommend the colposcope over loop because the colposcope we magnify up to 25 times. Um, majority we're at about 16 times magnification, which is much more than you could get with loops. Um, also, um, some companies are selling like the, an all-in-one um, like HRA machine. The optics are not very good. I really recommend um, getting a colposcope to do a, a proper exam. And then at about four times magnification, we examine the perianal area. And then at 16, um, that's how we examine the internal exam. And if something looks suspicious, we'll oftentimes increase magnification to like 25 times. So this is what you'll see when you insert um, the anoscope and look with magnification and acetic acid. Acetic acid, turns the squamous cells a nice white color and the rectal cells stay like the pink or red color. This is the squamous columnar junction. And you really wanna follow that all along, opening up any folds to, to really examine that area thoroughly with the acetic acid. This is that um, you know, initial picture was taken at 25 times magnification. Um, and you can see the squamous columnar junction. Um, the line goes here. 
And at the transition zone, you'll see some squamous cells sitting up on the rectum and some, um, some rectal cells like on, on the squamous um, mucosa. And this is really of squamous metaplasia, which is a normal finding that you see as a transition occurs. Once we examine with the acetic acid, we apply the Lugol's iodine and the squamous columnar junction is right over here. And the cells in this area turn dark brown in, in, normal, um, in normal cells. This is considered Lugol's positive. This area um, did not get taken up, the iodine did not get taken up into the cells. And that just means the cells are too thick to take it up. It could be from H cell, it could just be inflammation or low grade dysplasia. This represents Lugol's partial. So these are some pictures, we'll go over a lot of pictures, um, what you may see. This is low grade dysplasia. Right here, it says flat l cell. Normally, we don't treat flat l cell because it's asymptomatic. Um, it's not considered a precancerous lesion. So we tend to just leave that alone. Once we biopsy and prove that there's no H cell here, um, this is a wart, um, like warty lesions. They're also low grade dysplasia. This is intraanal H cell. Um, you can see the squamous columnar junction over here. Um, this is um, a faint aceto white area. It's flat and smooth. Right where the arrow is pointing now, you can see the uh, mosaic tile pattern. That's classic for H cell. And over here, you can see a more striated pattern. You can see the, the vessels kind of line up on, on these lines. That's what caused the striations. Um, it's also a, a classic sign that there'd be H cell. So these, this is an area I would definitely do a couple of biopsies in to look for H cell. This is a second lesion, uh, also um, an H cell lesion. You could tell this lesion is a little bit thicker. Um, it's a bright, really bright acetal whitening here. This lesion um, has really distinct margins um, that you could appreciate in contrast to the lesion above that has um, less distinct margins. There's also the mosaic pattern over here. You see kind of like a tile pattern, even extending down in this area. And then all these little dots, they're the um, abnormal vessels that look like coarse punctation. This is a very concerning lesion um, of H cell. Uh, if I saw this lesion, I'd probably excise it instead of just getting little biopsies so the pathologist could evaluate to look for any um, occult cancer. This is a lesion that you may even be able to palpate with a digital rectal examination. These are some examples of squamous cell carcinoma. You can see this lesion looks very similar to this H cell lesion. Um, again, it's a lesion that you could probably palpate. You, could, you would notice this without any kind of acetic acid or, or Lugol's iodine. Some examples of some external H cell. The first one is like the classic bowenoid anal dysplasia. Um, it's thicker um, hyperpigmented lesions. This is um, erythroplakia um, of H cell. It's more red ulcerated looking. Here is leukoplakia. It's thicker white, almost like chronic irritation in appearance. And this is Baruchus H cell that's similar to warts in appearance. So the patient had a chronic irritation um, for over a year who came to the practice. Um, it was biopsied, and this, there was actually a small um, squamous cell carcinoma in here. So if you see patients with this chronic irritation that lasts for a long time, it's really important, especially in these high-risk patients, to do a biopsy to make sure there's, there's no cancer. This is a patient I recently saw that came through with chronic irritation. Um, this lesion on the left anterior area, it looked worse than the rest because there's irritation everywhere. Um, I did two biopsies, um, one right at the margin and one in the middle of the lesion. This is all H cell, and um, the pathologist said cannot rule out um, a microinvasion. So this patient, I'm twisting his arm to let me excise a lesion to send it to pathology, um, trying to get him on the OR schedule, but he's very resistant. But um, it could be this kind of benign looking lesion could be harboring a cancer. A patient that came in with a hemorrhoid, um, there was a small um, superficially invasive cancer diagnosed within this larger, not really hemorrhoid, but um, H cell lesion. So this is a patient I recently saw. This is more of what you'll see when you first do HRA. It's a little bit, you know, not as pretty as a textbook pictures. When you insert the anoscope, you're gonna probably see some bulging rectal mucosa coming at you, some um, hemorrhoids. Oops. If you look carefully, you'll see the squamous columnar junction after the application of the acetic acid. It's really important that you find this um, area and examine it well before applying the iodine. Um, and so once you find this lesion, you apply the iodine. It's all tracheal the iodine. It's beautiful Lugol's positive. It's an area that looks normal. Um, no biopsies needed. Um, but you can see this bulging rectal mucosa is kind of obscuring a lot of the squamous columnar junction. So it's very important to push the anoscope into this to flatten it out. So um, 
you can see like the tip of the lugol is positive. This is when you flatten down the lesion, squamoclumnar junction is here. The margin is a little bit less distinct. Um, that's classic for HCL because the, the squamous cells kind of creep up under the rectal mucosa. And after applying the iodine, this area was uh, Lugol's negative. Uh, this blue arrow is pointing to some uh, coarse punctation that you um, can see over here and a mosaic tile pattern um, up here. So these are two areas that, um, that are in biopsy. So this is the same patient, um, just going around more anteriorly. You're gonna see this like thicker lesion over here. Um, the margins are a little bit more distinct than, than, the, last, than the last one. Um, you can see some coarse punctation, um, some ringed glands over here. When we apply the iodine, um, this area was all Lugol's negative. So again, two areas you would definitely want to biopsy to rule out each cell. Um, again, the same patients are just continuing on. You can see some striated vessels, some ring glands over here. Um, this lesion, this area looks a little bit thicker. This area is a little bit thinner. But again, areas that you'd want to biopsy. So once we um, detect h cell, um, what do we do? Um, so for h cell, you want to treat all of it because this is a direct anal cancer precursor. However, we um, only treat once the pathology is back because a lot of these lesions we biopsy may turn out not to be cancer. It could be squamous metaplasia, it could be low grade dysplasia, not necessarily H cell. Also, if it is cancer, we don't just want to burn it away. We're gonna, we want to get an accurate diagnosis um, because a patient may need um, chemo radiation to treat the cancer. So that's why we always wait for pathology to come back before we treat anything. Um, for internal H cell, almost always we use like electrocautery ablation. Um, external, still we almost usually, almost always ablate. However, sometimes we may want to use a topical uh, cream to treat uh, because external disease oftentimes is much more diffuse and it's also more painful to treat. Um, usually we'll use 5-fluorouracil um, as a topical lotion. You could also use imiquimod. It's really important that there's no role of wide local excision, um, mapping wide local excision. It's very morbid for the patients and does no better than just targeted ablation. Uh, recurrence is almost expected for this because we're getting rid of the high-grade lesions. We're not curing the patient of the high-risk HPV. So it's very common for patients over their lifetime to get more H cell pop up. Um, so long-term follow-up is important, especially in immunosuppressed patients. Um, you're, go you're going to see um, recurrence in these patients. Condyloma is not considered precancerous. Most patients want them treated, so we end up treating most patients. Um, it's also a marker for more advanced lesions. So anyone with anal condyloma, you're going to want to do a high-resolution endoscopy to look for h cell. So I'll usually um, look for h cell. That way I could ablate it when I ablate the condyloma. Um, even if the patient doesn't want their condyloma ablated or treated, I often encourage doing it. This way we get rid of all these lesions so it's a, so it's a lot easier to look for h cell um, and follow up in the future. Um, most of my patients want me to just, you know, cauterize the lesions. It's quicker. But um, you know, you could try imiquimod. There's other topicals like Veragen, Pedophilox, Sidofavir can all be used um, for treatment. However, after um, you know, usually we'll do a four month treatment with topicals. If it doesn't all go away, I usually recommend just um, fulgurating the lesions. Um, here's a recent patient I just treated. Um, we did biopsies first. This whole area came back as anal H cell, um, and this is you can see the cauterized areas um, after the treatment. So um, this little skin tag corresponds to this one over here. The skin tag over there, um, you know, after treatment is um, this, this lesion. So all the H cell is gone. Um, and it looks like it's, it's pretty morbid, which it is a painful procedure, um, but it doesn't really leave any long-term evidence that any treatment was even done. Here's a similar patient with a posterior H cell lesion. Six months later, you could see there's some hyperpigmentation um, from the inflammation, but a year later, you can't even tell the patient had any treatment done. Um, here's um, a recent patient I just treated um, an internal spot. You can see after the acetic acid is applied, there's this um, bright acetyl white area with some coarse punctation. Um, you apply the Lugol's iodine. This is all Lugol's negative. Did the biopsy came back as H cell, and then you just with electrocautery ablate the lesion. Um, you just ablate to the level of the submucosa, which is, you could see, it's kind of hard to see, but over here, the kind of like that wispy areolar tissue, once you get there, you're deep enough. And as you're doing the procedure, you could even see some um, submucosal vessels, and you don't have to go any deeper than that. 
Um, once you get to the um, distal, the mid or distal anal canal, you'd see an HCL that was the same patient um, of the internal disease. Here's like a distal anal canal lesion. Um, you can't apply the Lugol's iodine at the distal canal because the, the lining is already thicker, so it won't take up the iodine. Pretty much everything is Lugol's negative, so you have to rely on the acetic, the acetic acid findings. Um, and then here's the ablation. Again, you could kind of see the, the submucosal areolar tissue, and all this is after the fulguration. So when do we recommend topical therapy? So for small diffuse condyloma, it may be um, easier for the patient to um, apply the, the topical treatment, maybe less painful. And then you may want to do it after they've healed to reduce recurrence. If someone has diffuse perianal disease, um, you know, since it's such a morbid procedure, you may want to try a topical first. It doesn't always clear the disease, but it may debulk it a lot. So it makes, um, it makes ablation easier. It is really important not to keep using topicals for a very long time because I've seen patients come in who are on topicals to progress to cancer on the topical therapy. Um, for intraanal HCL, almost always recommend um, ablation. You could use electrocautery, laser, infrared coagulator, or radiofrequency ablation. They all work. We usually, usually use electrocautery ablation because in a study that was done um, in our office, it looks like there's lower recurrence rates with electrocautery ablation. It wasn't statistically significant, but it seemed to trend toward lower recurrence. And you could control the depth very easily, control the areas you're treating very easily. Um, and this is a familiar form of treatment for most surgeons who are just using the bovi. So the long-term results, this is the same uh, Goldstone study that looked at progression to cancer rates. Um, he also looked at, um, at recurrence after ablation. Um, uh, in the HIV positive group, um, he treated 400, 1,484 lesions, and there's a recurrence rate of about 27%. In HIV negative patients, there's a recurrence rate of about 16%. And after subsequent treatment, about the same thing, about 16 to 27% will recur after each treatment. However, the, the number of recurrent lesions was small. So, you know, it's not burdensome to the, for the patients to undergo um, treatment for like one or two lesions. And that was the average um, number of lesions that recurred after the initial treatment. So the um, International Anal, Neopl Anal, Anal Neoplasia Society, or IANS, they published um, a standard, practice standards for um, anal cancer screening. They recommend that clinicians who do anal cancer screening, do um, a, they recommend more than 100 um, cytologies or pap tests per year, but at least 50, that they complete more than 100 HRAs per year, and diagnose more than 50 H cell lesions per year. And most HRA should take place between five and 15 minutes and um, problematic pain or bleeding um, should be less than 10%. So, um, you know, it's, it's important that we vaccinate our patients. Um, Gardasil 9, that's the only HPV vaccine available in the US right now. It protects against 85% of cervical cancers and 90% of genital warts. Um, it's also um, effective for anal cancer and oropharyngeal cancer as well. The Advisory Committee on um, Immunization Practices updated their guidelines in 2018. Um, they kept the guidelines that age 9 through 26, that routine uh, vaccine be given with a catch-up vaccine for those who were unvaccinated up to age 26. And after age 26, um, shared clinical decision-making between the patient and the provider up to age 45. So any patient who's at risk for HPV cancers, we recommend vaccinating up to age 45. Um, it's not licensed after age 45, so most of the times insurance doesn't cover it, and it's a couple hundred dollars per vaccine. But I recommend to all my patients who are at increased risk, even after 45, to consider getting the HPV vaccine. So this is a study looking at recurrent anal lesions um, in patients who are vaccinated versus those who are unvaccinated. Um, this is a group of HIV negative men who have sex with men. And up to three years, there was um, a decreased recurrence risk of H cell um, after treatment. So it looks like the vaccine probably does um, help prevent recurrent H cell. And it's thought to do this by increasing antibody levels of, um, that occur after vaccination. In the initial Gardasil trials with um, several thousand women, some of the women tested positive for um, HPV type 16 and 18. Um, and after vaccination um, in these women, HP, um, HPV 16 titers went up by about 50 fold. So with those increased titers, it leads you to believe that probably your body could fight off the HPV better. 
So it's, it's a good thing to vaccinate um, patients. Um, just in disclosure, there was a second study that was published looking at um, vaccinating after HCL and HIV positive individuals, both men and women. And that uh, paper did not report a decreased incidence of HCL after HIV after HPV vaccination and HIV positive individuals. And so maybe they did not amount the same immune response, but it was a small study like this one. So I do recommend um, to everyone get the HPV vaccine. So in conclusion, anal cancer is on the rise. In certain patients, the rates of anal cancer are higher than the general population risk of breast, prostate, lung, and colorectal and cervical cancers. Nearly all anal cancers are caused by high-risk HPV strains and vaccination is important for both primary and secondary prevention. Anal HCL is a direct precancer to anal cancer, and um, using um, cytology and HRA, um, we could find these lesions and ablate them, um, analogous to the treatment of cervical HCL. Many retrospective studies for, for many years have been showing a benefit of HCL treatment, and the ANCHOR trial confirmed basically what we already knew, so now there's really no excuse not to screen. Um, recurrent HL is common, and it's important to follow these patients long term. So that's the end of my presentation. So there's a lot of time for questions, um, if there's any. Yes, we do have a few questions. Thank you so much. That was really great. I think all of those photos were particularly helpful, and especially I'll be you know going back and reviewing that lecture on YouTube and Surge on just so I can remind myself of what things should look like, especially when I'm on my own next year. So definitely thank you for that. Um, I had a quick kind of semi-related question while other people get some questions in the chat. Um, you mentioned using numbing lubrication when you do your uh, rectal exam. Does that affect when you're trying to like either assess their tone or their squeeze or like their expulsion? Um, no, it doesn't really. Um, I think it's, you know, it's, it does numb. I think it kind of takes the edge off of a lot of the pressure when I apply the pressure but they still do have um, some, sen some sensation. Okay. Um, our first question is from Sir John from Dr. Singh. He, uh, or he, they ask, what kind of pap smear kit do you use and where do you send it in the lab? And is there any company that you recommend for pap smear kits? Um, we get ours from the lab where we send it. So um, generally in the office, we'll use um, like Enzo Labs or Quest Labs. Um, Enzo is now be, um, joining LabCorp, so um, we get everything through them. So if you just ask them for the um, the cytology um, brush, we don't have a brush anymore, the actual swab, a Dacron swab, and the cytology solution, we use one called FinPrep. Um, and uh, yeah, we just send it to them. It's important that you like talk with your um, pathologist in the lab that you're going to be using um, because you want to send it to a really experienced um, gynecologic pathologist not a GI pathologist, um, because the GI pathologists just aren't used to looking at these specimens. Um, sometimes if I do a procedure in the hospital, it goes to GI, even though I asked her to go to GYN pathology, and I'll get um, results showing, you know, benign squamous mucosa. I'm like, no, this is definitely HCL, so I ask the GYN pathologist to look at it, and, you know, she usually confirms, yes, this is HCL. So um, it's really important that you speak with the lab, um, they could, you know, give you the kits that, that they'll run in, in their lab for the testing, and they have a good, you know, line of communication going with your gynecologic pathologist, because oftentimes, you know, I'll call them, give them a heads up if I think, you know, this is a really concerning lesion, I think this may be cancer, can you, you know, take a look at it, um, this way we have a good relationship with them. Awesome, thank you. Uh, Dr. Garcia asks, what instrument do you use for your biopsy during your H HRA? Um, they're called baby tischlers. Um, it's kind of like um, a handle that's attached to like a long, thin, like arm that can reach for the anoscope. And then it has um, short, uh, uh, like teeth on it to get like small bites of the mucosa. Um, I think it's a, actually like an ENT instrument. And um, I think the gynecologists also use the same one for doing their cervical biopsies. If you ever want, I could... Um, give you anyone like a list of like the equipment that we use I could you know where we order it from and send pictures if anyone's interested but they're called baby tischlers yeah I definitely would love that uh, if you want to just send it to our like gmail account then if anyone's interested they can either email us or email you uh, to get a copy of it too yeah sure sounds good yeah 
I see at least one fellow saying, yes, please send it to me. <laughs> sure. um, all right, uh, another question from Dr. Sir John, uh, from Dr. Kim, uh, or more of a comment that he uses a cyto brush. Uh, it might be a little bit more uncomfortable, but he thinks uh, that it's better. Uh, the data is a little inadequate, but similar with the swab. Um, and then Dr. Walker asked, are you ablating in the office or OR? And it sounded like mainly in the office. Yeah, almost everyone um, I blade in the office. Um, if people have, you know, low burden of disease, um, even if they have a lot of disease and they want to, we can do it all with local anesthetic. Um, so most patients are awake for the ablation. If they have um, a lot of lesions, we'll offer them anesthesia almost always in the office. Um, we have an anesthesiologist come to our office once a week, so we could do it right there. Um, sometimes I'll do it in, in the hospital based on patient preference or insurance coverage. Um, now where I do my colonoscopy at the endoscopy center, they have a whole setup. So um, you really could do it in the endoscopy suite, do it in the OR in your office, wherever is like, you know, more economical and comfortable for your patient, I think is totally fine. Awesome. Uh, another question from Sir John from Dr. Shanker. She asked, what percent of your patients need some sedation for the procedures you do in the office? Um, for the HRA and biopsies without ablation, more than 99% are awake. If someone's had, um, you know, they could have had like chemo radiation for anal cancer and we're following them, they may have some stenosis from that. Um, some patients, you know, may have been sexually abused or they have, you know, a lot of anal pain. Um, then we'll uh, then the one sedation and we'll offer sedation for that. But 99 plus percent of the time, the HRAs are done totally awake. And same thing for ablations. I'd say probably about, you know, in a week, I may do like five to 10 ablations with anesthesia and probably do about 20 ablations without anesthesia. So what's that? Like 80% without, I guess. Yeah. Um, all right, uh, Dr. Modi says, what are the protective measures you take to prevent exposure to the aerosolization in office? Well, um, probably not as many as I should. We have a, a vacuum that's attached to our electric cautery device. Um, you know, we need that so we could see because once we start doing the ablation, the anoscope fills up with the with the smoke. So we have a smoke evacuator that clears everything out and filters it. Um, and for perianal disease, I'll ask the um, our medical assistant to kind of hold the smoke evacuator device like close to the to the electric cautery. Um, we don't use any special masks or anything. You know, I know there has been like cases of people getting nasopharyngeal condyloma and things from from that apparently, but you know we're vaporizing these cells at such a high temperature. Hopefully, it destroys anything. But um, we use regular, you know, sometimes not even a mask, but just the smoke evacuators. All that we we use. Yeah, when I was at the University of Michigan these past couple months, I heard similar things. That really the studies that showed the um, the vector from patient to doctor actually wasn't on anal cancer patients and might not have been the best data, um, but I've definitely heard, you know, you need to wear a 95 or things like that. Yeah, because of COVID, I started, you know, wearing a mask in the office, but before COVID, no mask at all. And um, just a smoke evacuator. It gets rid of most of it, but you could still smell a little bit of the, of the smoke. Um, I apologize if I mispronounce your name, but we have another question from Dr. Surjan from Dr. Karas. Karas. Uh, if you see an area that you are concerned on initial anoscopy, do you just biopsy or do you biopsy and treat with electrocautery at the same time? No. Um, so if it's on, on a regular anoscopy, then I'll do an HRA right away. Um, if I see it, the other way, I can take a good look all around for any, um, you know, simultaneous lesions. If... Um, if there is, um, if, if I'm doing the HRA, if I see a lesion, I will always wait for pathology to come back. Um, you know, because a lot of times you don't realize that there, it could actually be a cancer or that's not the most common occurrence and more common occurrence is that it's not each cell. It comes back as squamous metaplasia. And then you don't want to overtreat the patients either. Great. Uh, Dr. Conan says, how do you counsel patients on sexual practices for anoreceptive intercourse who have a diagnosis of condyloma or H-cell? 
Um, so I tell them, like, think of HPV like glitter. So if you put glitter on your penis and have sex, the glitter is going to be everywhere, just like HPV. So um, they've already been exposed to HPV if they've been sexually active before. Um, any future sexual partner they have has been exposed to HPV already uh, if they've had sex before. So you can't avoid HPV. Um, just because they have HL lesions doesn't mean that their sexual partners will because most people who are exposed to HPV are going to clear it. It's only if they get a chronic infection that they're going to form these lesions. So I recommend that they, um, you know, don't change their sexual activity at all because they have HPV. Uh, condoms reduce the transmission by about 30% every time they have sex. So if they want to use a condom, great, but it, because of HPV, um, it doesn't do a great job of preventing the spread. Um, so I tell them, you know, they don't have to inform their partners if they want to do a public service announcement so their partners get screened, that's great but not to feel compelled to like disclose it because a lot of people hear, oh, you have HPV, um, then you know they don't realize that everyone has HPV. So yeah, they don't have to disclose it if they don't want to. It's not like if they had gonorrhea or chlamydia, tell them, make sure you tell your sexual partners. This is just one of those things, um, either consider the most common STD or not even STD at all, just a marker of sexual activity. Dr. Trelizzi, this is uh, Avery Walker. I have a couple questions, um, if you don't mind. Um, one of your slides said that we should be doing over 100 uh, patients for HRA to, to, be, to, to do it well. I, you, we went through it real quick. I was just a little confused because I'm nowhere near 100 patients. Yeah, could, you, could you see my screen? I pulled it up, right? Uh, is it on? I don't know if it's on. Yeah, so that comes from. Um, oh, yeah, there it is. Yeah, the International Anal Neoplasia Society. They're kind of like the um, like the people who've been doing HRAs like forever. Like they're like the world experts on anal dysplasia. It's like basically all they do. So, um, you know, it, it is good. The more you do, the better, obviously. Um, and again, this is for people who, you know, aren't necessarily surgeons who don't have the manual dexterity that a lot of the surgeons have. And yeah, it's a great. It's great to try to do that many. And of course, if you do that many, you'll be better at it. But um, I really think that, you know, if you have an interest in doing anal dysplasia screening, just do it. Because um, if you do an HRA, your, your fifth HRA you do is going to be better than the patient who's never had one before. So um, it's a good goal to shoot for. But I think that, um, yeah, don't let that deter you from getting involved in doing it. Because there's just not enough providers out there doing it. Right. I mean, I don't want to turn away a patient just because I've done five in two months and it's like, hey, I'm not even close to the hundred, right? Like, no, exactly. And, you know, I think, you know, if you're in a city where um, there's another HRA provider doing it, um, they, they would definitely be more than happy to have you go observe them, do cases with them if you're in the same institution, because um, everyone who does this knows that there are, not, there are not enough clinicians out there doing it. So they would definitely be happy to work with you and, and get you up there. I will say, if you're not doing a lot of a lot of um, cases, it's really important to um, take pictures of everything that you do, and then when you get your pathology results, go back and review. Okay, I biopsied this; um, it came back as H cell. I biopsied that; it didn't. And just do not feel bad to do more biopsies than you think that you need, because patients tolerate the biopsies really well. They're not painful at all, especially if they're like proximal to the dentate line. Even the distal biopsies are not that painful, and it's better to like over biopsy than than wish you had biopsied something. So I'm I'm sorry, I still have a few more questions because yeah, yeah, yeah. that um, that point about it not hurting and, and they're tolerating it. I'm just kind of mind blown that you do this all in the clinic. And I mean, after I do these to patients, they just seem to be in so much pain afterwards. So I I just I I, I want is there some way you can tell me how you do it a little bit more because that just seems so painful the the biopsy or the the treatment yeah. the, the biopsy I, I mean I, I typically do that in the OR with uh with a microscope that the ENT guys use which mm -hmm. they don't really appreciate that but whatever <laughs> um, but uh that's the only scope I have and and uh -huh. um uh, it seems to work quite well I can see you very nicely um they tolerate the biopsy it's the fulguration and you said you're fulgurating in the OR in the office too right yeah, so um, you know, I'll go try to find a picture of H cell. I could kind of let's see. So um, I guess you could you could kind of see the spot this picture, right? 
So say that we see this green arrow on the right. If I went to, to ablate this lesion right over here, um, what I would do is I would, I'd withdraw the anoscope till I get to like the, the distal margin of the lesion. And then um, using a 30 gauge needle, I would inject probably about 0.5 cc's of marking. Wow. Uh, so they, they do feel a little pinch, but um, it only lasts a second. And then I would go around, like find every lesion they have, inject the marking under that. Um, it's pretty well tolerated. The small amount of marking is important because the more you inject, the more it's going to hurt. Because when you're ejecting, you're pretty much right at the dentate line or just a little distal to it. Um, also, you don't want to use a lot of local because it's going to um, make the tissue wet and then the electric cautery doesn't work as well. So um, what, I, what I do is um, after I inject it just a little bit distal to the lesion, give it about a minute um, to take effect. And then I'll usually start um, a mark the distal margin of the lesion with my electric cautery. Because once you start treating, the iodine sometimes gets washed out and then you kind of lose where that margin is. So um, I'll, I'll, I'll like kind of mark the distal margin of the lesion and then I'll start treating going proximally up onto the rectum. And then I even treat the benign looking rectum like just proximal to the lesion because they're not gonna have any pain with that at all. And that way I'm sure I get the entire lesion. Um, and like three spots or so, the patients do super well with it. I mean, you know, if you're gonna have like this anxious patient who's not gonna tolerate it, just book them for anesthesia. But most patients tolerate up to three lesions, totally fine. So is there any role for like doing a strip of mucosa within the anal canal? Because like if you're targeting these little lesions because you're, you're very good at finding the areas, for those of us that don't do very much, is there any role of, like I said, doing like a strip of anal, anal derm and then coming back in six months and doing another strip that you found pi positive biopsies or something like that just to make sure you get it all? You know, I really wouldn't want to over-treat, you know, because I think if you're going to, because you're going to be following these patients closely. So if someone has HL that I treat, you're going to like bring them back in six months. If you're not sure you got it, I'll bring them back in three months, you know, and you're going to find any bad HL. Um, it's going to be pretty obvious to you. So I'd rather, you know, treat a little bit and not cause too much pain than over-treat the patients because then they're going to, they're not going to come back to you if they're having pain. Like I see a lot of patients that saw a different provider like years ago and they said, I'm never going back to them because it was so painful um, and yeah. they're really reluctant to get treatment. Um, so I think whatever you could do to minimize the pain is pretty important. If they have a lot, if they have one or two lesions, I'll tell them just to take Tylenol, Motrin, lidocaine cream. If they have a lot of disease, I'll send them home with, with narcotics as well. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. Uh, another question from Surgeon from Dr. Uh, Maturi. I hope I said that correctly. Do you see cases of coexistence of anal rectal adenocarcinoma with HSO or uh, squamous cell? You know, I've, I don't think I've ever seen an anal adenocarcinoma at a fellowship now, like almost eight years. I'll, I mean, I have patients that are high risk for squamous cell carcinoma. Most of my patients are men of sex with men or um, HIV positive patients. Um, but I've only seen squamous cell carcinoma in my practice. And then Dr. Solomon had a quick comment from Sir John, just saying that you'd be amazed at how much you can do in the office to a properly blocked patient. Yeah, for sure, yeah. All right, well, I think that is all the questions that uh, I see on both platforms. Thank you again so much. Uh, this has been super educational. I think a lot of people had really great questions. We'll be posting the recordings later this week. Uh, and have a great night, everyone. Thank you.